Just help me out. I don't think we have the words, but just sing it with me. Silent night. seated. Listen now as the choir sings. thinking as the choir sang what a contrast because many in the world will sing the Christmas carols in fact uh, the the most famous entertainer will get up and sing the Christmas carols but only a believer can sing that song that they know the reason for the Christmas carol 
you know, the, 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 the performers in New York or Los Angeles or whatever, they can sing the first Noel, but only the child of God can say, I'm free because of that child. And uh, what a beautiful, beautiful just uh, contrast that we can sing a song the world, they may know the words to, but they don't know the reason behind. And I thank God I can sing the first Noel. I can sing uh, Angels We Have Heard on High. I can sing all those songs. But I know who I sing about on a personal basis. Amen. And it's Christmas time. Now, I know it's hard to get into the Christmas spirit when it's 80 degrees outside. Uh, and uh, we're singing Christmas songs and thinking about going to the beach this afternoon, right? But. It is Christmas time. It's the advent of our Lord, and we just thank the Lord that we know him and are thankful that you're here today for all of our friends who are in, uh, uh, let's, let's just say this carefully. Uh, I'm going to make a statement. If you know why I make the statement, say amen. If you don't know why I make the statement, don't let it worry you. But the only statement that I'd like to make this morning is War Eagle. Amen. All right. Other than that, that's okay. But uh, if you're a guest this morning or first time in a long time, we're so thankful that you're here today. Honestly, we mean that. We love having you in our service. And if you'd slip your hand up, one of these good men want to give you a packet of information about our church. And uh, all over the building this morning, we're thankful that you're here. Hopefully, you're in a good Sunday school class. We had a great Sunday school hour. And are looking forward to a good service here. Let's stand to our feet together. It is so good to see Heather Brickell here today. She is recovering from major surgery and her first service back. Fashionable neck brace that you're wearing today, Heather. I like that. And we're going to let our choir come down, find their place with you. Father, bless this service. Be pleased with what you hear and what we say. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you. We're glad you're here. Let's sing together. Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains. Sing it with me. Ready? Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains. And the mountains in reply, echoing their joyous strain. Him who 
whose birth the angels sing. Come adore on bended knee, Christ the Lord, the newborn King. Gloria in excelsis Deo. Let's go to the next song. I love this next song. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Sing this one. Yeah, that's right. Sing it nice and loud with me. Go tell it on the mountain. Ready? Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Verse 1, ready? While shepherds kept their watching or silent flocks by night, behold, throughout the heavens there shone a holy light. Go tell it on the mountain over the hills and everywhere go tell it on the mountain that jesus christ is born down in a lonely manger the humble christ was born and brought us god's salvation that blessed christmas morn Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. I think you know that this next one, away in a manger, no crib for a bed, but the tune is a little bit different than what you might know, so stay with me. Ready? Away in a manger, no crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. The stars in the bright sky looked down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay. The cattle are lowing, the baby awakes. But little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. I love thee, Lord Jesus, look down from the sky and stay by my till morning is nigh. Be near me, Lord Jesus, I ask thee to stay close by me forever and love me, I pray. Bless all the dear children in thy tender care and fit us for heaven to live with thee there. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Let me just tell you right now that I have no idea what F-U-T spells. I'm, I have nothing, so I, I don't know. But let's pray that together. Lord, put us there. Amen. Amen. Sometimes our graphics designers and department, they, they mean well, bless their heart. But uh, they're footing us to heaven. Oh, that's good. Several years ago, when I first came to community, Brother Jim uh, Morton, who is, of course, our chairman, our deacon chairman, just a godly, godly man, he said, now, Pastor, I'm involved with the Gideons. I've been, been so for years. And, of course, you and I, many of us understand the Gideons are Christian businessmen. Uh, that uh, just have a burden to see souls saved by the placing of the Word of God in hotels, uh, prisons, 
schools, wherever they are allowed, they want to get a copy of the Word of God. And I said, great, Brother Jim, you come, and you, you get us fired up about getting the Bible out. He said, well, I can't come. I'm like, what do you mean you can't? He said, well, I'm a member of this church, but I'm in the other camp. Now, I thought we Baptists had problems about being in one camp or another, but he's in the wrong camp, and his, his side of town is the other side. He said, but I got a guy. And he introduced me uh, to Dr. Uh, Gordon, and Doc's been coming, I guess, three or four years now. And just, I love this brother in the Lord. He is just such a gentle, good man, has a burden for souls. And um, he has been around this city forever, uh, been a dentist, but, but we know him as our Gideon man. And I want, Doc, you come and just uh, give us our annual report and tell us what's going on last year. Uh, we took an offering on this Sunday, and several thousand dollars came in, and we were able to send that directly to the publishing and printing and distribution of God's Word. So you listen as Doc comes. Stancil, and good morning, congregation. It's always wonderful to worship with you. I enjoy coming here. Don't bother us. Don't call. Don't write anymore. That's what Bobby Horn's mother told him after he violated his probation and went back to jail a second time. His mother said if that was the kind of life that he chose to live, that he could live it without her and without the family. At a very young age, Bobby began using drugs and alcohol. He stole a car, got caught by the police, put in jail. A Gideon came and gave him a copy of God's Word, but he didn't take it seriously. Finally, he got released from jail, but he went right back to drugs and alcohol. It was at that time that his mother came to him and said those words, Don't bother us. Don't call. Don't write. We don't want to have anything more to do with you. Her words broke Bobby's heart, got his attention. He went back to his cell and made a decision to read that copy of God's Word. As he did, he realized he didn't know Jesus. And so he prayed and asked the Lord to help him. And of course, then the Holy Spirit began to do a work in his life. Bobby began writing letters of asking forgiveness of those that he had wronged. The same getting that he had met earlier came back to the jail and also helped him along. When Bobby was released from prison, fortunately, his wife had waited for him. He started over. Today, he's a Gideon, and he's ministering to prisoners in jail. As Gideons, we regularly experience the truth of God's word from Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please and prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. In the following video, we're going to see another uh, illustration of how Jack Ben Scotter tells his own story. In uh, 1972, I found myself in the federal penitentiary at Terre Haute, Indiana. I was there for what I like to call an authorized withdrawal of funds from a federally insured financial institution with a 32 automatic. I was in a riot in my dormitory and got locked down for a week, two weeks. In the middle of the second week, they, they made an announcement. Anybody that wanted to leave the dormitory and go to a, a meeting put on by the Gideons could leave at that time. While I had traveled all over the United States and seen Gideon Bibles and hotels. I didn't pay any attention to the Gideon emblem. Uh, I knew, knew, didn't know who the Gideons were, had no idea. But I wanted out of that dormitory after a week and a half, I was getting squirrely. So uh, I went to that meeting and there was a Gideon there by the name of Jimmy Klein. Jimmy told me that Jesus loved me. Uh, I said, Jimmy, you got the wrong guy. My mama don't even love me. What are you talking about? Jesus loves me. And he took me to John 3.16. And he says, Jack, your name is in that verse. I said, well, no, my name is Jack, not John. He said, no, that's not what I'm talking about. He says, you're a whosoever. They gave me a Bible, was, had the cover torn off of it. I could take that back to my dormitory, and none of the other guys would know what I was reading. But I read that until I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Every Wednesday night, we would have a Bible study with those Gideons, and they would mentor us in the Word. There were seven of us that accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Of the seven, six are now ministers, and I'm, the, I'm a Gideon.
you may wonder why the Bible the, uh, was torn, the cover torn off. That was for security reasons. All the Bibles, when we take them into jail, we have to do that. Uh, the Gideons are, an, as the pastors told you, an interdenominational association of Christian business and professional men and their wives in 196 countries whose sole purpose is to introduce boys and girls, men and women, to Jesus Christ and then allow the Holy Spirit to lead them into acceptance of Christ as their Lord and Savior. Uh, last year, we gave out over 89 million scriptures worldwide, but there are over 4 billion people in this world that do not have a scripture and do not know Jesus. What the harvest is great. Um, in Pinellas County, we gave out thousands last year, uh, hotels, motels, to individuals, to prisoners, uh, to people we meet daily, uh, to our students in junior, senior high, and colleges, uh, in nursing homes, uh, transitional housing facilities, many other places as well. Recently, I read an inspiring story about a small Gideon camp in Oreo, Russia. Three members set out to make a distribution to some small towns around them. However, the only transportation they had were their skis. And so they carried the scriptures in packs on their backs. And boy, I can tell you, these Bibles get heavy. I can't imagine the weight and trying to ski with them. But that's what they did. They got to a school late in the evening. The director there let them sleep in the school that night. And then they were able to distribute scriptures to all the students the next morning. They proceeded down the road on the skis with their uh, packs and Bibles on their backs, but they were stopped by the police. The police wanted to see their documents and what was in the bags, and after they had inspected it, then they said to them, you know, we thought that you were terrorists carrying explosives in those bags, but now that we know who you are, please get in our police car, and we want to escort you to your next location. And so they did, and when they got there, they even went in to talk to the director and urge him to allow the Gideons to make a distribution, which they did. Doesn't God work in wonderful and mysterious ways when we're simply faithful? We pray for, we ask you to remember us in your prayers, the Gideon ministry. Uh, we obviously come and, and ask for your support financially by cash check or credit card as you have so generously done in the past. The Gideons themselves pay all the administrative expenses, therefore for an investment of about a dollar and a quarter now, you can provide for the purchase and placement of a scripture throughout the world. This includes all the cost of getting a scripture into the hands of someone who needs it. In only 14 of the 196 countries where Gideons are active, do the local Gideons have the funds necessary for all of the distributions that are done. So that's where uh, you and I become important in helping to provide uh, their support. I want to encourage you also, when you come in from the parking lot on the east side, there's a display case there that has Gideon cards in it that can be used for all occasions. They have been beautifully redesigned this year, so I th hope you'll look at them. Their cards are free. They include a spiritual message, a testimony, a scripture. For, more, uh, for a donation, no more than the cost that you would use to purchase a card at the store, you can provide encouragement to a loved one as well as providing for the placement of a scripture that may save one or more lives. Raymond Merrick's a part-time bus driver for Children's Services in Monroe County, Ohio. He keeps a Gideon Bible in the front of his van in the hopes that uh, children will ask about it. One day a little boy asked what, what, what it was. The child's parents were divorced. His father was schizophrenic. His mother had no interest in the child. This child in the first grade uh, had been so disruptive that the school officials had had to call the sheriff's office several times to come and control him. He should not have been passed on to second grade, but his first grade teacher just couldn't bear the thought of working with him for another year. And so he was going into second grade. Uh, he had just started in school at a different school in second grade when he asked about that scripture. The bus driver, Mr. Merrick, asked if he could read, and the boy said, well, he was learning to read. So then the driver said, well, that's a copy of God's word. The little boy's eyes grew big, and he said, it is? And the bus driver said, yes, son, it is. He says, and if you promise me that you'll take good care of it, he says, I'll give you a copy. Well, the boy said that he certainly would take good care of it, and so he, he got his scripture. The next week, uh, the bus driver was picking up the boy again, and uh, his little four-year-old brother who had just been stung by a bee, and he was crying uncontrollably. 
the two children got on the bus, and as they started to drive away, the driver heard the older boy say to the younger brother, he said, if you will just ask Jesus into your heart, the bee sting will stop hurting. Well, the little four-year-old was sobbing. He says, but I don't know how. <laughs> and, and his brother said, just repeat after me. And at this point, this little second grader repeated, uh, prayed very uh, carefully, very accurately, the sinner's prayer. And when he was through, the bus driver said he looked in his rearview mirror and he said that little four-year-old had a big smile on his face and he didn't mention that bee sting again. When they arrived at children's services, the older boy told the driver, he said, I still say some things that are wrong sometimes, but when I do, I ask Jesus to forgive me. Amazing, little children can learn with the scripture, the Holy Spirit leading them. Thank you, Pastor, and, and thank you, congregation, for the generous way you have supported the Gideons in the past. It's only by God's grace and with your help that we can continue to distribute scriptures worldwide. So thank you again. Appreciate you, Doc. God bless you, buddy. Love you. At the end of the service this morning, we're going to take an offering, and that'll go straight to publishing and printing, distributing Bibles. How many of you ever been in a hotel or perhaps prison or other place? And uh, <laughs> say amen right there. And uh, and you looked over there, and you've seen that Gideon Bible and thought, uh, you know what, I always had, you know, had my Bible, and I thought, man, I thank the Lord that it's sitting there if somebody ever needs it. Now, unfortunately, I've been in some hotels lately where there's been no Gideon Bible. And uh, the chain operator or that owner uh, has not allowed the Gideons to put I thought, you know, some desperate woman or some desperate man or maybe just somebody seeking, uh, just uh, uh, looking for an answer after maybe a long night of sin. Uh, and they go to look for something there in that drawer and it's not there. Uh, I've also seen some Korans in some of the hotels I've been in lately and uh, other books. And uh, yet the Word of God, faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. And I remember Charles Keene said years ago, uh, dirty water is better than no water. And I thought if they could just just get to the scripture. You know, sometimes they'll take anything at the right moment. And maybe that time in prison where a gentleman on the, on the video or in uh, a night of looking. I remember when I was lost. Take your Bibles, Colossians 3. I was saved, but I was lost as far as sin was going. And I remember thinking if this was all there was to life, there's not much to living. Now, I was a saved man, knew better. And, of course, my faith from childhood brought me back to the Lord. But I know if I thought that as a rebellious, runaway, lost in sin Christian, I could only imagine how lost people without Christ would feel. And uh, so you pray for Brother Gordon and for Brother Jim and our Gideons. Again, one of the few non-local church ministries that we support because they only have one mission, that's printing and publishing the Bible and getting that into the hands of uh, men and women. Now, Colossians 3, we, we have been verse by verse to the Bible. And one of the reasons that you love verse by verse to the Scripture is whatever the next verse is, you have to preach it. You can't skip it. You can't go around it. You can't dodge it. You can't duck it. And so uh, I, I was excited last week, last Sunday evening, we finished Verse 17, and I said, great, let's look at verse 18. And I thought, wow, what a good Sunday morning message. Colossians chapter 3, verse 18. Wives, submit. Wives, submit. Now, let me just stop there and say, men, that's where most of you stop reading that verse. You say, the Bible says, wives, submit. And wives, you ought to submit. And I'm telling you, I, I read a verse somewhere in the Bible that said, wives, submit. And if you're a caveman, Neanderthal, uh, that's where you quit reading. But thankfully, thankfully, that's the first two words of a great passage of Scripture concerning Christian order and structure. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, Wives, read this next verse with me out loud for your husbands. As it is fit in the Lord. As it is fit, proper, or right in the Lord. Husbands, 
Let's read this, men, together. Love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Four distinct and separate commands of Scripture. Wives submit, husbands love, children obey, fathers, parents provoke not. Now, here's... Here's what I want to say this morning. First of all, that's Bible. Amen. And I know we live in 2013, a culturally challenging environment, but this is the Word of God. Now, let me say uh, several introductory things, and then I'll give you just a simple thought this morning. We'll come back tonight and develop this in greater detail. I remember hearing years ago a sermon by Brother Howells entitled, They Love Our Product, But They Don't Like Our Recipe. They love our product. And I I took that sermon when I heard him preach it, and I thought, man, I'll make that famous. And I took that sermon and came back to our church, and and I got out a a, a big old table, and I took off the pulpit for that evening service, and and I put up a table, and and I got out a mixing bowl, and I got out flour, and I got out eggs, and I got out all the ingredients of a big old chocolate cake. And, and, And beforehand, I'd ask one of our ladies to bake a chocolate cake, and in the kitchen, which in our church in Texas was kind of right off the fellowship hall, say amen right there, and uh, you could just leave the auditorium and go right into the kitchen, I thought that was brilliant, but uh, uh, I had that big old chocolate cake sitting there, and I had on this table, and I put on a, if I remember right, I put on an apron, and I was cute, and uh, I I put on an apron, I had uh, flour, and eggs, and milk, and whatever else was uh, called for, and I said, now how many of you would like to eat a big old cup of flour, and nobody wanted to eat a cup of flour, I said, how many of you would like to eat uh, uh, two or three raw eggs, and some of my weightlifter guys said, I do that every morning, but that ruined the illustration, and uh, I said, how many of you would like to drink, and uh, the buttermilk or the milk and I went through all that and I said now individually none of these ingredients are appetizing I said but when you put them all together and you mix them up and you put them for a set amount of time in the oven and about that time I had somebody bring that big cake out and I said when you put all the ingredients together and follow the recipe you get the product and about that time I took out a big old knife and cut off a big old honking slice of chocolate cake and God is my witness I ate it in front of the congregation (laughs) and I had chocolate drooling off both sides and I said "Mm, wouldn't you like some no I made this cake Colossians 3.18 Colossians 3.19, Colossians 3.20, and Colossians 3.21 are ingredients for a successful family. It's the recipe God gave us to produce the right kind of home. The world loves our product, but they hate our recipe. See, they want a husband and wife that live together and love together and and grow together and and have that sweet spirit. And and they want children that are well-behaved and well-adjusted and and, and have good manners. And (coughs) It is not uh, uncommon. In fact, it's rare if it doesn't happen for us to go into a restaurant and and with a bunch of our church family and and our children and, and somebody say, oh, Y'all have the most polite children. We very rarely see that. Boy, they love the product. But then they read verse 18 and say, I ain't doing that. And husbands read verse 19 and say, I don't think so. And children say, I'm going to do what I want to do. And fathers stir up and provoke. And you can't have the product without following the recipe. 
my wife will tell you that every now and then I'll get a wild hair and I'll go in the kitchen and I'm going to make something. It's always amazing that when she bakes it, it's perfect. And when I bake it, it's a what is it? I want the product, but read the instructions. Follow the rules. See, here's your problem and my problem. You want the dream, but you're not willing to pay the price. Wives, well, submit to your own husbands as it's fit, proper, or right in the Lord. If a wife is to submit to her husband's leadership, husbands, love your wives. Husbands, love as Ephesians 5 tells us. By the way, I told our Sunday school class this morning, Paul writes almost verbatim four different times the same lesson throughout his epistles. Why? Because it's important we get the recipe right. So the product's right. And Titus, we talked about it in Sunday school this morning. If we don't get the product right, we give occasion to the enemies of God to blaspheme. See, you Christians, you talk about Jesus and you talk about the power of God and you talk about how good God is, but your home, your marriage, your family, they're just as messed up. They're just as dysfunctional. And because you don't follow the ingredients, your product is not right, and that gives occasion for the enemies, <coughs> enemies of God to blaspheme. I said this morning in Sunday school, I'll say it again to you, submission can only come if there's loving leadership. My wife won't submit. Dear friend, I love you, but neither would I. I my wife, she's, she, she won't follow me. Dear friend, I love you, but you're not leading anywhere. Husband, how, how spiritually are you leading the home? See, it is the priest's role it is the father's role to have the priest's responsibility in the home. It's amazing to me, and I've traveled enough, and I've been around a little bit, to see that in most churches there is a stronger spiritual leadership among the ladies of the church than the men of the church. And in many churches, you, you would say, well, I went to so-and-so's church, and I tell you what, there just sure is a lot of ladies in charge over there. And I would submit to you, here may be the reason. Because the men abdicated the responsibility. And the lady said, I would rather do it than it not be done. For there to be submission Ladies, you need somebody to submit to. Dads, husbands, let me ask you, where's your spiritual leadership? You're asking them to submit and God telling them to submit, but what are they submitting to? I would encourage some of you that are having some marriage trouble, stop looking at the lady and start leading spiritually yourself. And I promise you this, it has never failed, almost never failed. And I may, be, I may, may be able to give you an exception or two to the rule, but I have almost never seen anybody who lovingly leads like the Lord Jesus Christ have a problem with submission from a lady. But I have seen a ton of ladies who longed to submit, but their husbands would not give them anything to submit to. We have far too many hens crowing and roosters nesting. Some of you will explain that to Keith later. I appreciate that. Farm term, zoom. Submission is universal. It's funny. We will submit at work, but when God says submit at home, we have a problem with that. Submission is universal. If you're speeding and a police pulls, policeman pulls you over, it's amazing. You'll submit. Authority is nothing new. In fact, authority is ordained of God. Order is ordained of God. You cannot see creation and not realize that God has ordered it. 
God has said the sun is going to rule over the moon. And he placed in order. And then it comes to his greatest creation, the human race. And he said, husbands, you're to lead. Wives, you're taken out from the side. Not beneath, not above, but alongside of. And husbands, the wife was given you to complete you, to be a blessing to you, to fulfill you. Husbands, do your job so wives can do their job. My message this morning in its simplicity could really be boiled down to this. If we had more loving leadership from the father, we would have a lot more submission from the mother. I made this statement in Sunday school. It's not a personality thing. Brother Sanson, you're loud, you lead. Leadership is not just being loud. Some of the greatest leaders I've ever been around were very quiet, very small, soft-spoken. They, they walked softly, as it were. Well, Brother Sanson, if I was just more flamboyant, that's not leadership. I know a lot of loud people that don't lead anywhere. Boy, we have leadership failure spiritually. We have leadership failure fit, uh, financially. Oh, my wife, she just wants to control the checkbook. Well, guys, I love to tell you that, that uh, if you would do a better job, they wouldn't have to control the checkbook. If you would work, I had a young man tell me this week, his girlfriend's daddy hasn't had a job in three years. Now listen, after a while, I'm going to work. It may not be the job I want, but I'm not going to sit around while my wife goes out to make a living and I sit around playing video games. I don't understand the culture we talked about in Sunday school. I don't understand the culture that's, that, that says I'll wait, I'll wait till somebody takes care of me. Dad, husband, when you took a wife, what you're saying to God, to that preacher, to that lady, to her family is, I will provide for her. Leadership spiritually, leadership financially. You say, well, preacher, my wife makes better money than I do. I'm not saying about the money. If she's got a degree and maybe the Lord's blessed her or maybe she's found a niche and, and she makes tremendous money, it's no excuse for you. But this I, and, and if you're doing this, I'm not trying to offend you, please. And what I'm about to say is going to be very offensive. But it'll be a cold day in hell. It'll be an awful long day in hell for me to ever be Mr. Mom while my wife goes out and be Mrs. Executive. This idea of this role reversal is unbiblical. Lead. Well, preacher, that verse said, why I've submitted. You're not preaching about her submitting. No, dear friend, because I'm trying to get you to understand her submission problem is your leadership problem nine times out of ten. Preacher, I wish you'd preach against her for a while. Well, I'll come to her when I come to you on that loving leadership. But right now, the submission problem, the submission problem, the submission problem, nine times out of ten is a leadership problem. Now, if your husband is lovingly leading you and you're having trouble with that, we'll get to you in a few days because there's a lot to say in that husbands loving their wives as Christ loved the church part, and we'll cover that. But I'm saying right now that a lot of the problem nowadays is not a wife being unwilling to, but a 40-year-old husband sitting around playing video games all day while the house is in disrepair. We talked about this in Sunday school. I know I'm rehearsing a lot of this for some of you, but some of you need to hear it twice. Uh, if, if anybody's going to work two jobs, it ought to be the husband, not the wife. Well, we don't have enough money. Well, your 30-hour-a-week schedule, big boy, probably could have a few more hours of work in it. Well, we're just struggling. Lead. I don't know how to lead. Ask somebody. Ask them, these men of the gray hair that have been down the road, ask them what they did to put food on their table when there wasn't good jobs. Some of you think, oh, I'm only making $8 an hour. Some, and I'm not making this up. Some of these men remember making $8 a week. 
And you say, well, times were different. Yeah, they had character. You don't. Times were different. Yes, amen, Brother Stansel. Say amen right there. There's a character problem with our men. Oh, she's such a strong leader. Maybe, but it also could be that you're such a weak leader that she has to step up because you've abdicated your responsibility in the home. Now, I'm just telling you, this is 20 years of pastoral counseling, 17 years as senior pastor, assistant pastor, Bible college, and I've looked at it over and over again. Now, some of you lead softly, but you lead. It is not a personality thing. It is a responsibility thing. You're not loud. Your wife is. Still, I'm going to use a couple of examples. I hope they don't be offended. If not, it's okay. David is not as loud and outgoing as his wife. But I guarantee you, I know who leads their home. There's no question. Ray and Roe, they're very quiet and sweet, but I know who leads their home. It's, it's Brother Dory, oh, everybody knows who, Brother Dory, he's just strong, outgoing. It has nothing to do with it. You don't have to carry a stick and beat him on the head. Wives, look at, look at the verse. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it's fit. The word fit there means proper. Show me a godly man and a godly woman who passionately pursue a relationship with Christ, who is following Christ in their finances, in their spiritual walk, in their leadership. I will show you good ingredients that will produce a home worth having. But most of our problems, we're lazy. We're unthoughtful. We're unmotivated. Contentment is I'm happy with what the Lord has given me to do. Laziness is I'll not do any more than I have to. And then you have the audacity to say, well, we're really struggling. I hope God does something. Yeah, God has done something. He's given you strength and ability to go get a job. To work. We were laughing, Brother Jim and I were laughing in Sunday school. Oh, boy, this college is tough. I mean, this, this full time load. What, what's the full time load for you? Well, 12 hours at college and 20 hours a week at work. Wait till you have babies. Then you'll know what a full time load is. And I mean that in more ways than one. Say amen. Society says you don't have to grow up. The Bible says quit ye like men. That word quit there doesn't mean quit being a man. It means stand up and be a man. Society says, oh, he's just a, he's just a 19-year-old boy. In the culture previous to this, 19-year-old boys were marrying and were leading homes, fighting wars, living and doing. Now 19-year-old boys are playing video games don't have a job, don't have a driver's license, don't have any gumption about them, don't have any get up and go. Society, oh, their children, we send them off to Iraq without any problem. We send them off to Iran without any problem. Submission is universal. Submission is spiritual. Submission is governmental. Submission is relational I look at our homes and I, I wonder if most of our problems could not be cured by a man who patterned his life from the principles of the scripture following Christ teaching on the home if that wife would not get up in the morning and say man Lord I have such a godly spiritual father husband I want to do whatever I can to complete, to help, to come alongside. Instead, most of our ladies wake up and say, it's all up to me today. 
If we're going to get it done, I've got to do it. By the way, let me just say this. If you're not married and he's not that man now, he will not be that man when you get married. You're looking at the wrong things, ladies. It ain't about his looks. It ain't about what he has or doesn't have. Does he love God and willing to learn and grow and follow him? Expectation of submission. We preached on this, by the way. If you remember a few last year or two, we preached on this as we went through uh, some passages on the home. But I was just thinking, submission is not this idea that whatever he does, I follow. If he's doing wrong, don't follow that. As it's fit or proper, Lord, as he does right, you follow him. You allow him to lead and you follow uh, as he leads. So number one, husbands must lead. Number two, wives submit. Word submission is an easy word to understand. It, it means to obey, to follow. As a husband leads, you say, well, how do I have confidence in his leadership? Very simple. How do you have confidence in anybody's leadership? The Word of God. You, you know how you have confidence in your pastor's leadership? The Word of God. If the pastor is not aligned with the Word of God, follow the Word of God, not the pastor. So I don't know what kind of husband I have. Open the Scriptures to Titus chapter 2 and begin to look at your husband and look at the model of the Word of God. Look at First Timothy. Look at Titus. Look at the epistles and say, here's the man of God that I ought to see in my husband and submit to that authority. Again, back to the husbands, you also ought to look at that, and whatever those qualifications, whatever those principles are, they ought to be trying to be applied in your life. But submission, let me go back to this. Number one, there must be leadership. Number two, there must be submission. Submission says, I will do what is fit or proper in the Lord. That means I'll follow. If your husband says, hey, let's go do wicked and vile things, you say, no. No, that's not fit or proper. I said in Sunday school this morning, sometimes a husband gives you opportunity to, to do right even though he may not be right. But there are certain things that, that you can follow. You need to follow as much as you possibly can because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, as you look at that, he says that your conversation, uh, your demeanor, your spiritual nature as you follow Christ in, in 1 Corinthians 11, that if you can follow him and be that help me to him, then by your conversation, you can actually win him to Christ. So as you learn to submit, you say, preacher, I can't submit to everything. Submit to what you can. If he says, let's go do wicked and vile things, say, as a Christian, I can't do that, but I'll follow you in the bills and the finances. Now, see, that's some of our problems. A husband goes and works and does, and he says, now, honey, we have this much to spend. And then you go spend twice that much. We, we can't do this, and you go do it anyway. I would really like you not to do this. And it, we're not talking about a spiritual value taught in Scripture. We're talking about something that, that you could submit in. When you don't submit in what you can, don't expect him to grow into what you can't. Uh, he's not doing right. Well, he's doing right on all these other things. You're thinking, just because he's not faithful, Tammy Welch and Eric Welch are the best example of this. Tammy and Eric, our church in Texas, he never came to church. But everything she did in church and out as much as possible, other than her going to church without him, she submitted to her husband. One January Sunday morning, he walked in and has not walked out since because she submitted in areas she could other than the church thing. She said, you stay home, you ride motorcycles, you do whatever you do, but Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, I'm going to tithe off of my income. I'm not going to ask you to tithe off of yours. I'm going to do what I can do, and by God's grace, through her conversation or testimony, she literally brought him to the place to where now he follows the Lord as well. Submission. Preacher, you just don't know my wife. You don't know my wife. The Bible says I'm to follow, the wife is to follow her own husband. 
The biggest problems that I have in my life, in my marriage, if I did right, I guarantee you, would not be a problem. My wife's already proven she'll follow me. My wife's already proven. But when I don't lead, she has no one to follow. Your marriage problem is not her problem, it's your problem. Say, preacher, you're wrong. I did right. I did right. And, and, and she just rebelled. That's an exception to the rule, and there's always people that just choose to do wrong, and I understand that. But I promise you this, Dad, if you will love her as Christ loved the church. By the way, ladies, if you think you're going to find a better man than a man who loves you as Christ loved the church, you're mistaken. See, our ingredients are not that hard. Oh, I need counsel. Let me give you some counsel. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter. And I'll explain that tonight. Not make them bitter. We'll talk about that tonight. Fathers, well, preach, we, we need special counseling. I just gave you enough in two verses to spend the next two years working on. See, the problem is you want different ingredients and get the same product. You don't want to submit. You don't want to lead. Oh, I want a happy marriage. If you ain't leading, she ain't submitting, there's no happy marriage. I'm, I'm, I'm not being funny here, guys. There's nothing new under the sun. Well, we live in 2013. I don't care if we live in 3013. Wives, submit. Husbands, love. And I guarantee you, about 95% of the garbage that you waste time worried about would disappear. Oh, you're just old-fashioned. I'm as old-fashioned as the pages of this book. Oh, it just, it's not in style anymore. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word will abide forever. And by the way, let me just tell you something. Some of the biggest nods I'm getting right here, some of the biggest amens right over here, right back here, from those that tried to change the ingredients and it blew up in their face and they're saying, boy, next time I'll use the ingredients, right? Because she tried to be the boss. And he abdicated the responsibility. And it blew them up and it blew their children up. And by the way, because it blew them up and their children up, it'll blow their children's children up as well. Some of you guys, you need to start crowing a little more and roosting a little less. Step up and lead. And ladies, let's just see if he leads how much easier it is to follow. If I told my wife, if I told my wife, I, I really believe it's God's will for us to go north. Now, for my wife, north is anything above Ocala. <laughs> just, she'd say this because she's already said it three times. She'd say, I don't necessarily want to go north, but if you're 100% sure it's God's will, let's pack. She said that when we went to Michigan. She said that when we went to Texas. And with great tears, she said that when we came here. I don't want to do this, but if you're sure it's God's will, I'll go. Now, let me tell you something, Keith. I was as sure on all three of those, confident, Here's your problem. Honey, what are you going to do? I don't know. Honey, what God called you to do? I don't know. Well, you had this job and that job, and you were in here, and we bounced around. No wonder she's not leading you. You've not given her or demonstrated to her any confidence that you know where you're going. If you're following God, God doesn't let his children wander lost. Even in the wilderness experience, God still had a plan whether they understood it or not. You follow God, they'll follow you. Some of you guys, I can't get no girl. Well, I wouldn't be with you either. 
You've never stayed anywhere and done anything long enough to prove that you've got a plan. Just, just sit down and say, I'm going to stay and do what God's called me to do. And, and the problem is we're trying to start something and fix something and find something. Just lock in and do. Tonight we'll break this down. I, I want to be a little more explicit tonight. But I thought submission was enough for most of you this morning. Our marriage is just a mess. Submit. Well, he's not a good Christian. Submit in the areas you can. Lovingly allow Christ to work in his life through your life. Husbands, are you loving and leading as Christ loved and led the church? Father, we think about the greatest submission ever was that you humbled yourself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And we understand by the New Testament, you didn't relish the fact of the cross, but you willingly submitted yourself to the authority of your Father. How then do we struggle so desperately against authority. The greatest example of submission ever given was you, and now you say, husbands, follow me, wives, follow husbands, and yet we rail against the authority given by God. I know in our church, I know in, in any church, our church, my old church, any church we'll ever be a part of, there will always be those men that just will not lead. They're selfish. They're self-centered. They're lazy. And Lord, I wish the women wouldn't have married them in the first place, but they did, and this is what they've got. So God may, by her conversation, by her convert, by her lifestyle, may you convict and work in his life. And then, Lord, there's those men that do love you and do want to serve you, and their wives, for whatever reason, chafe at leadership. Their hearts are turned toward the things of this world. Maybe, maybe like a Lot's wife, she just couldn't let go of the world, and maybe, maybe a husband's trying to lead. May, Lord, that loving Christ-like leadership so affect that stubborn, rebellious wife that she would finally surrender to the leadership of her husband. Lord, as we surrender to one another, we most of all surrender to you. Our mark of Christianity is really seen, Lord, in how we're surrendered to each other because ultimately it's a test of how we're surrendered to you. Bless our people. Help us to, to learn to love and live together that the word of God be not blasphemed. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Let's stand to our feet. No one's moving. Unless you're coming to the altar. By coming this morning, you're not saying, I'm a terrible husband, I'm a terrible wife. What you're saying is, with God's help, I want to grow, I want to mature. I want to be that spiritual leader. I want to be submissive to the God leadership of my husband. I want to date the right person, marry the right person. Whatever the relationship I'm in now, I want to make it stronger. Leadership leads followers follow but they got to have an example to follow maybe you're here this morning you've never surrendered your life to Christ you've never trusted Christ as your savior the greatest submission in the world is to give yourself completely to the Lord Jesus Christ the altars are already full folks are still coming Keith begins to sing folks are here to pray with you if you, if you really do need to talk to somebody counseling you come We'll set you up with one of our workers. Keith sings, others are coming. You join these here. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am.
tonight we'll come back, heads are right, eyes are closed. We'll come back and look at Ephesians together and look at these other places. The product of your home is in direct correlation to the ingredients of your home. I could not imagine a life, a home, where there's chaos, confusion, animosity, unsettledness. And yet many of you, that's the norm in your life. You're, you're up always in transition, always seem to be in confusion. And it's almost like, and I know, I know you don't think this way, but it's almost like if there is not a problem, you've got to go find a problem. Not, that's not the way God had designed this. The home is to be that place of refuge. It's to be that quiet place. How's that come? Husbands leading, wives following, children obeying, fathers not provoking. Valerie said in the Sunday school this morning, she said, so many of our people, they don't have any example so many, they don't have any example, no father, no mother, no home. They need somebody to teach them this is normal from the Scripture. What you've experienced is abnormal. That's not life. Life is not chaos and stress, brokenness. If they don't come to a church where husbands and wives loving each other following Christ, leading their home. They're going to simply duplicate what they've experienced and continue the cycle. Many of you this morning, your goal is to break the cycle. You want to be the first in your family to be that solid, stable husband, wife. I'm a second generation. My father broke the cycle. Freed's father broke the cycle in their home. God help you this morning. Get the scriptural ingredients to your home. Break the cycle. Don't reproduce what you have in the life of your children. Let me make this last statement. If you are tied to one of these who is not doing this, Preach, let's just get a divorce. No. It's your choice. You married for whatever reason. Now, they may have changed or you may have just made a mistake. I understand that. But now this is God's will. So by your lifestyle, you have to be an exceptional Christian to win them. For so many of our young people dating, you look at me. All this group over here, big singles better make sure before you settle in that they have the qualities and convictions. It's not about looks. It's not about circumstance. It's not about finances. It's about Christian character. I'd rather warn you now while you're not married than you come see me after the fact. I can help you now. Let me give you a good word. Ready? Let's learn it together. No. Gentlemen, let's come receive the offering. Jane is going to join the church this morning. What a blessing. And this is a wonderful lady. She's coming to us from uh, Pennsylvania area. And all God's people said, praise God. Amen. But uh, Jane, you've trusted Christ as your Savior and been scripturally baptized. Jane's husband was a preacher. And uh, they loved the Lord, served the Lord together. The Lord took him home rather early. And she wants to spend the rest of her life serving the Lord. And she's here in our church and uh, looking for a, a, a job. She, she's uh, moved down here on faith and uh, just believe the Lord's going to do some great things. And, and we're excited about this. Wonderful son in the military and daughter up north. And we've met all those uh, family members. But uh, we're excited about having Jane come. All God's people said, amen. amen. What a blessing. Somebody's child is having a great nursery experience. <laughs> so uh, I don't know whose child that is, but... Uh, let's find out, obey, that's verse number 20 right there, all right? So, Father, bless the offering, the gift, and the giver. Then as we receive the offering for the Gideons in just a few moments, may, Lord, uh, we give to help get the Word of God published and printed and distributed 
around the world. We pray it now in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you as you give. Thank you, Marty. Amen. I'm going to ask our ushers to get ready. And what we want to do is we want to receive a, an offering. Everything you give at this point will go to the Gideons. Uh, if you have a check, you want to write a check, write it to the church. Then we'll write them a check. But uh, this will all go to uh, Brother Norton as he takes this back to uh, the Gideons and uh, printing of the Word of God. While they're coming, gentlemen, you come on. And uh, while they're coming... We're going to make a few announcements, and uh, you listen to these announcements while we receive this offering, and then we'll be dismissed together. Uh, gentlemen, you may receive that offering. Brother Tyler, you come on, please. Lots of stuff going on this month of December, lots of busyness going on. Uh, first of all, we would like to announce that we are having our dress rehearsal for our Christmas program. Uh, we've got two different practices this week. First of all, the program with just the speakers, the people that are in the program that are uh, doing the speaking parts, we're having a practice again this Thursday night at 6.30, just like we've been doing. Uh, but then 5 o'clock on Saturday, anybody that's in the adult choir, uh, kids who are in junior church, people, if you can have your children here to help run through uh, the program two or three times, make sure we've got it all down, know when we're coming up and going down. 5 o'clock on Saturday afternoon, 5 o'clock Saturday afternoon. So if you guys can be here for that, the adult choir, children's choir, speaking parts, everybody. We're going to run through it several times, make sure we know uh, who's going where, things like that. Also, December uh, is kind of a, is a very busy month. We've got Christmas parties, and we've got a lot of people out of town. So uh, during the month of December, we're not going to have an organized time for visitation. We usually do it on Tuesday nights. Uh, we're not going to have those meetings. Uh, feel free to come by and pick up visits from the office if you need to or whatever. We're not going to have an organized time for that. We'll start those back up on January 14th on Tuesday nights, um, just to kind of give us a break there. Then also, we have Philippine prayer bands out in the out in the information booth. Also, if you would like to buy some of the uh, Ministry 226 ones, if you'd like some of those, those can also be made available to you. Uh, but those are all $2 a piece, the Philippine Prayer Bands ones. All the proceeds will go to uh, helping offset the cost of that uh, trip that we'll be taking next year to the Philippines for our church. Um, then also, our young adult Christmas party is next Sunday night after the service. Uh, we'll be meeting right over here in the cube. We'll let you know about what things to bring or whatever like that. Uh, we're going to be doing a gift exchange of $15 or less, but not too much less, because uh, I may end up with your present. I don't want to get a terrible present at the end of that. So, uh, Then also, this Tuesday night, we're having our seniors' Christmas party as well. Uh, it starts at 6.30, again, over in the cube, December 10th. Uh, also, it's $15 per person. If you've signed up and not paid, you need to make sure you pay uh, so that they can know how many people are going. If you haven't signed up and haven't paid, do both of those before tonight so that Brother Warren can get a good count on the food and how much we need to get set up for and all that stuff. Uh, then also, the, uh, in a week and a half, two weeks, uh, we're going to have our junior church Christmas caroling. Uh, so if your kids are involved in that, if you guys want to take your kids caroling, bring them to the church. We're going to be leaving here at 6 o'clock. 
on December 20th. Bring $5 for food. We're going to take them to a fast food place somewhere. It's always a lot of fun. People always enjoy having the kids come and sing to them. Uh, then last of all, also, we have our Seniors Angel Tree out in the lobby. If you'd like to grab a, a, a present from off that tree, a name from off that tree with something that you can get for someone, just to be a blessing to someone that doesn't get out or doesn't able to, isn't able to have family around them as much in the holidays as they would like, uh, just make sure you go ahead and take a look at that. Many of those Christmas for seniors presents, grab one, buy the present, bring it unwrapped to the church, and we'll get it to a senior in need. Also, uh, let me say this, uh, if you're interested in going through a week-long chaplain training program, this will train you and equip you to get into one of the police departments. Brother Meacham and several of our men are doing this. See Brother Meacham, he'll give you information. The dates are January 13th through the 17th. And if you have any questions, see Brother Meacham, see Miss Lori, and we'll explain that to you. Uh, also, if you'd like to help us at Boca Ciega, uh, if you have missed the announcement, uh, Brother Davis has taken the past trip of the Highland Park Community Bible Baptist Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee. They'll be leaving in January, January 1st to be a transitioning time for them. So uh, you pray for that. But that also leaves a hole in our mentoring program because both of them had people they were mentoring. be a great time to sign up and to get involved with mentoring with us over at the local high school. And uh, we praise the Lord for uh, the opportunity to invest in some of these folks' lives, the young, young children. Then we have got a neat ministry opportunity, something I never thought about until coming to community. Many of you are caregivers for folks with dementia, Alzheimer's, uh, serious health issues. And many times you're looking for uh, encouragement, uh, wisdom, advice. We are going to start January a caregiver's uh, ministry. And uh, Judy Osborne, who has a lot of experience in this, is going to be leading this. Uh, we're excited about this, and she's going to help you just with going through the process of dealing with someone with a dementia, Alzheimer's, or serious health issues. And so uh, we'll begin to give you more information about that come January. And then our Dorcas Missionary Prayer Band, uh, they are taking orders out in the lobby for these neat little flower pens. All the proceeds are for our work in Haiti. And uh, we're excited. We found the containers at a reasonable price that are shipping eligible. And uh, so a lot of neat things going on with our Dorcas uh, uh, missionary ladies. Deacons, we're going to have our Christmas lunch after church this morning. We'll see you there. Let's all stand together and uh, shake hands, fellowship. If you're a guest this morning, come and meet me. I have a gift for you. Pray for Bobby Bagnick. His back is out. I love you. God bless you. You're dismissed.